The following is a production of DallasCowboys.com and the Dallas Cowboys Football Club. How about them, Cowboys? Yeah! Go, baby. Are you ready for a break? Uh, yes. Are you ready for a break? Absolutely. Ready for a break? Yeah, and um, so much for that. It's time for The Break on DallasCowboys.com. We were on the break! With Ambar Garcia, Brian Broadus, Patrick Walker, and Derek Eagleton. It is Tuesday, December 26th, 2023, season 19, episode number 95. Welcome to the latest edition of The Break. It is uh, it is a Tuesday, but it feels like a Wednesday because the Cowboys are getting ready for a Saturday game. And we're talking about a game that happened on Sunday. 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 <laughs> Sunday. Sunday. It's We're all over the map. But today we're going to recap that game. We uh, it's, it's an interesting game. Although the Cowboys locked it, lost, there were lots of things, I think, that came out of the game that were noteworthy uh, that we're going to talk about today. And then tomorrow we'll jump right in and we'll start getting you guys ready uh, for Cowboys versus Lions. We'll talk about the Lions offense tomorrow versus this Cowboys defense. But let's start first with uh, the game versus Miami. Uh, Dallas loses 22-20. to um, Tell me, storyline of the game. Let's go around the table. Storyline of the game. Patrick, we'll start with you. For me, it was basically that this was Philadelphia all over again. Um, it was a winnable game from the Cowboys. If you go in and you tell me that they're going to hold the Miami Dolphins offense to only one touchdown, I tell you, they – win this game um, but they did just enough to not win the game um, talk about the the fumbled handoff to Hunter Lipke on what was an exceptional opening drive and of course preceding that Tony Pollard gets turned around he can't get in that matters as well uh, and then fast forward to the offense stalling largely because your offensive line just didn't hold up Chuma Idoga we gave him roses for playing well Earlier this season, he had a very, very bad day at the office. Dak Prescott pressured on almost half of his dropbacks uh, and just couldn't get the offense going because of that. Um, and then penalties. Here we are, time, type and timing, penalties. That final offensive drive by the, by the Dolphins, you get the face mask on Damon Clark, gives them 15 yards, helps Jim start what was uh, an eventual game-winning field goal drive. So it was for me, it was the Philadelphia game all over again, and that's what makes it frustrating. This was not a situation where they got beat down like against the 49ers, where they got handled by the Bills because of penalties, and then that, that train went off the rails. They were competitive throughout this, this contest. Defense bent, didn't break, um, but ultimately the defense broke because the complimentary football was not there. Yeah, um, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, this tough loss for sure. I think we saw some improvement from the Cowboys playing on the road against a team, a very competitive team like the Miami Dolphins. Uh, Patrick mentioned the opening drive and that fumble, the recovery that Dolphins get it and all that. And then they come back, CeeDee Lamb, he gets into the end zone. They touch, So they responded really, really well to that mistake, which was good to see. They were competitive, but it just wasn't enough. I did think um, the defense was doing a good enough job. We knew how many... Off, like how many offensive weapons the Miami Dolphins have and how explosive they are, how quick. And the defense, I thought they did a nice job all in all, just being there fighting and doing what they could, but the offense just couldn't catch up. And and I'm concerned. Right now it's like, okay, yeah, they lost. Hey, let's come back, rally up and all that. Um, they're in the playoffs already, so you at least have that spot. But I'm thinking, how are they going to be able to survive with this O-line. I'm thinking about the O-line. I mean, I'm thinking, okay, what if Tyron Smith it re-injures his back or maybe he's out longer than we think? What are you doing to improve the offensive line? Because that look that we got in this game, I don't think you're going to get very far with what you've got. And it's very, very hard to improve um, anyone's game. For example, Chuma, how do you improve that in the last couple of weeks that are left heading into the playoffs? So I just, I like their performance as far as like them improving or showing signs of improvement on the road. But all in all, um, I'm, I am concerned about what the future holds with the current situation um, as far as the O-line health. When they don't uh, adhere to attention to detail, they're not going to win games. Mm -hmm. 
that just not going to happen. Uh, there were several times in this game. And, by the way, Adoga wasn't as terrible as everybody says. I think the mental mistakes that he made were far worse than the physical mistakes that he gave. I think your quarterback made a couple of mental mistakes, too. I think there were some hot reads that they missed on. I think one time they took a sack because they felt like that they were he had something picked up that wasn't picked up. Uh, you went away from creativity that you had early in the game. Uh, you know, and you, uh, you, you went and focused on other areas of the game when you had an advantage uh, with your receiver. You could have wore them out in this game with, with CeeDee Lamb. Again, attention to detail on that. Continue on, trying to attack uh, mode. Did a good job playing run defense against these guys. But, you know, if you're, if you're, you're going to let teams break you down with blitzes uh, and, and make, force you with mental areas... You're not going to win games, uh, and it's simple as that, right there. Because they had ability to win this football game, and you know, like I say, you don't give up huge plays on defense. You got fortunate though on the on the one play that Hill dropped earlier. That could have been a touchdown right out of the mm-hmm. gate coming out of there. But you know what? They, what did they do? They moved you with motion to get uh, create matchups. They did it a couple of times during that game. You know, you just got to be ready for that stuff, and it and it goes back to, you know, the penalties are a problem. Uh, you know, the, the things that, like I say, the, you know, when you're supposed to blitz pickup, being in the right spot, quarterback moves the back to one side, blitz comes from the side that he moves the guy away from. Those are all attention to details you got to have to win football games. You mentioned Dak Prescott. He was 20 of 32, uh, 253 yards, two touchdowns, no interception, a 107.9 rating. But, Brian, I agree with you. I was going back this morning and I was watching yeah. a lot of those pass plays. And one of the things that stuck out stuck out to me, which hasn't been something we've noticed a lot from Dak recently, he's been really just hot and he knows very decisive yes. with the ball. Yeah. I don't think he was nope. uh, on that in that game Saturday Sunday. I think there were a, a number of different times where they ended up with a sack or he ended up with pressure because he didn't he, he did I don't know if he wasn't seeing it or if he was anticipating that a guy was going to like cut off the route but there were times times it appeared again from our vantage point looking from that top camera, you know, you're not behind the center yeah. so you don't know. But but from our vantage point it looked like there were guys that were open and all he had to do was just let it go, and it just seemed like for whatever reason he was a bit more tentative. Did you guys see the same thing, and what would you attribute that to? I, I think that in, at times I did see that. Excuse me. <clears throat> I think that some of that goes to just the offensive line struggles, and I don't think he felt comfortable in mo- most, much of that game um, on his drop back. So it likely disrupted some of his timing, some of his reads, and, and just his overall window of operation. So I did see that a few times where it's just like, okay, if you get rid of the ball right now, then that's that's a first down, potentially. Um, but he, you know, the pressure was coming uh, at several points. <clears throat> Talk about Chuma Dogan. I, I mentioned this on uh, my hit with 105.3, the fan this morning, when it comes to Chuma. I don't think Chuma got beat up physically. That's not my issue with Chuma. My yeah. issue with Chuma is choosing assignment. Like, you don't let Bradley Chubb run free to your quarterback trying to help out. Tyler Smith. Let Tyler Smith do what Tyler Smith does, and you get Bradley Chubb. So yeah. I think the the amount of pressure that Dak Prescott felt in that game just completely kept him unsettled. And he, because he never was able to settle in, it just was not the usual Dak Prescott. Yeah, but they missed a shot too. They, I mean, they they run they they remember the remember the play that Turpin scored on mm-hmm. where they put him in the slot and they mm-hmm. ran vertical and and the Commanders tried to carry him with the safety down in the middle. Went to the same play, ran the same play against the split safeties, and Dak didn't throw the ball. Mm-hmm. And I yep. and I don't for the life of me know because to me you put Turpin in that situation to run that play. You clearly have a mind that they're going to play. They're going to play twin. They're going to play two safeties back there, and we're going to send Turpin on a vertical that for a forty yard dash, and no one's going to be able to pick him up. And for some reason, Dak just did not throw it. And the play, like I could say, it's designed for him to to throw the ball, lay it out there, and, and let Turpin run underneath it. There, there were several, there were several times where he pulled the ball down. And one time, Gallup is on the outside; he's going to throw the slant. Yeah. Gallup oh, gets man. mugged. I mean, Ramsey is just oh, beating man. him up. And then, so now, what happens? You know, he falls down. Now Dak forced to have to kind of try and find play, go forward, or throw it someplace else. Yeah. You know, I mean, there, there's there, there there were some there were some blitzes that I think there were a couple like I mentioned the hots. You know, one time it, like he's got cooks, he's got a blitzer coming on it in, into his face, and it's like you see cooks sees it's going to be hot, mm-hmm. and, and he's Dak, waiting for it. I know and, exactly. And Dak what you're pulls about. it, and yeah. you're like, 
God, just hit him. Yeah. You know, it's it's a five yard game, but at least you're not taking an incomplete or a sack or a, a negative play there. Yep. So you wonder, you know, what was going through because there was a period of time for very early in the game, I felt like he saw what he needed to see. Yep. And and they did some they did some really good things. And it wasn't until the end of the game that they started kind of getting Lamb back in the game. You know, and I think that's where all of a sudden, you know, it's the third and six. I'll give you an example of that. Finally, McCarthy is able to scheme Lamb open. And it's trips to the right. Tolbert motions away to the sidelines. And now what they did was they got they got the safe, they got the corner out of the way, and then the route comes to the corner route comes to the sidelines. Ball goes right there. There you go. That's the kind of stuff that you know you you saw it early in the game. But then, as the in the like for two quarters, you were like, "What offense is this running?" Or you know, yeah. "What offense is this playing football right now?" Yeah. And you know, whether it was the blind, the line, the the receivers, uh, the quarterback, the head coach, the play caller, there was just a disconnect for a couple of quarters there. And then they kind of figured things out at the end. Yeah. You know, it's probably a little bit too late. The, there, there was another play I noticed uh, early on in the game. This is again where. I, I question, you know, was it a situation where the pressure really got to Dak? Because some of these things were happening early enough in the game where it was before he was just, you know, feeling that yeah. that extra pressure. But I, there was one play where literally I kind of stopped it. I stopped the play, and and you've got Dak standing in the pocket. He's got the ball up. Yeah. And there is Gallup on the outside. Yeah. He's got two steps on the outside deep if you want to go there. Yeah. you got another guy. I think it was CD in, this, in the slot that's coming across the field. Yeah. He's open, like yeah. he's coming clear of the window. So there, there are these opportunities, and Dak is ready to throw, and then he pulls it down for whatever reason, yeah. and then ends up in pressure or sack. I don't remember what happened on the at the end of the play, but it wasn't a good turnout. Yeah. And it was a situation where he had the play, and that's what I think was to me. That's what I take from this game is that as though as as much as we want to say the offensive line didn't hold yeah. up. Dak, I think, has to take just as much accountability well, on that because I think is, he was just he was just a little bit. Not willing to, to pull the but trigger all the time. But with that comes into the mental game of things. When you go into a game knowing what who is protecting you, it's going to change the way you're thinking because now that's an added thing that you're trying to take account for. Like It's, it's very different. Uh, I'm trying to find... A scenario is like someone that let's say someone that cuts my hair all the time. I'm gonna go in like easy. I'm not even gonna say anything, worry about it. Mine be on my phone as opposed to someone that's new cutting my hair. I'm like freaking out and just like looking over my shoulder the whole time. So I think and I and I'm not to put. I don't. I hate putting all of the blame on somebody, but I I think because if you look at everything, that's really the only change that has happened. You still have the same weapons on offense you you have been playing really well the past few weeks and you've been clicking you've been accustomed to Mike McCarthy's play calling but then as soon as some element changes in the online and he's played with that before but I don't know I'm just trying to find the reason as yeah. to why because uh, there's know, no injuries there on him he's he, he's still the same Dak as he's been there's nothing else that has happened to be big they run a double screen they run a double screen on the play, and you can see after the play, Dak is pissed, yeah. and Lamb is pissed. They run a double screen. Dak makes the decision to throw it to the left with three blockers when he's got four, four blockers. And he said right. after the game, yeah. I probably should have gone over Yeah, see, that, that, and that's one. the yeah. thing about it. When you, have a, when you have a game where you're kind of struggling with the protection, screen's a good play. Screen's a good play, especially when you get upfield. But what happens, give the Dolphins some credit. Dolphins take, they take Chubb and Van Inkle, and they put them wide, and they they kind of put them off the ball. So they're like they're like anticipating you're probably going to run either slant or screen. Mm -hmm. So they're 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 playing the defense like so maybe it's something you check out of. Maybe you're thinking like okay I can't get my blocker out there. You know I can't get a Doga out there on Chubb. You know I can't. So I've got to think of something. But you know like I say. Three blockers one side, four blockers the other, and you have a clear advantage, but you choose the three blocker side. Yeah. Those are the kinds of things. Attention to detail in a game will get you hurt. I'll tell you this too, Amber. You say nothing had changed, and you're right from the standpoint of the personnel. But I do think uh, part of what I saw, at least my opinion, is he was playing a defensive coordinator 
that clearly Dak has a lot of respect for. Yeah. He talked about it after the game. They asked him about the question about CD and uh, and not having CD. And, and CD said in the locker room he thought it was – he agreed with a, a reporter mm-hmm. that it was kind of strange that weird. in the yeah. second and third yeah. quarter he was not mm-hmm. used as much. And they asked Dak about that, and Dak says, I mean, strange is a f- fair word, I guess. He said, but you got to remember that we're playing a defensive coordinator that's, that's very, very seasoned, and he has ways – of not letting you continue to do the things that you were getting success yeah, with. And so, yeah, he said he could fall. He, he had a way of kind of fogging things up. And it makes me wonder if, again, you take a play or two where he shows you something that, that kind of jars you, and does that make you a little more tentative now? Does that make you now think a little bit more about those throws before you make them? And that could be what, what we were seeing. I, I think there are that could be a part of this. And, and then the way they play defense, too. They have one of those kind of defenses that – they have a lot of guys in the line of scrimmage. You don't know in any given play who's coming, if all of them are coming, mm-hmm. if none of them are coming, right? And I think that can also cause you to be a little more tentative. So I think the difference was not necessarily in the personnel he didn't have as much. I think it was more about who he was playing and the way they play. Maybe the fumble with Hunter Lipke that early in the game, that that could be have played a role in his mental aspect of thing of now he's trying to be a little more hesitant be, and not trying to risk throwing an interception or something else. I, I wouldn't say that on that particular play because they bounced back from that. And like you well, said, they got, did. The, yeah, got the CD lamb, the big game, yeah. CD lamb touchdown. Um, and then, you know, you take the lead and at that point, your defense, uh, because keep in mind, even your defense responded to that. Yeah. They gave up the 50 yard, 50 yarder on third down to waddle with the, you know, uh, backs against the wall for the dolphins. And you hate that, but they didn't break. They fought, they kept it to a 57 yard field goal um, by Sanders. So your defense was holding, um, not the penalty wise, but your defense was doing what they needed to do. And as an offense, Offense, all you needed to do was build on that C.D. Lamb touchdown and then start to create distance. And then now you put them into the blueprint that you want them into, which you want them to, to pass the ball because you've also shown that you were doing well in the run defense, right? Coming off of a horrible game in, in Buffalo, you did well in containing Mostert and yeah. A-Chain and, and uh, Jeff Wilson. So uh, all the Cowboys offense had to do was continue to find ways to put up points. But when you go, they had that sequence where it was like third consecutive punts yeah, your defense is bending, not breaking. So it's field goal for the Dolphins, field goal for the Dolphins, field goal for the Dolphins. But the whole time you're, that's happening, you're looking at your offense not put up points. So it's like, okay, punt, punt, Aubrey, punt, 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 Aubrey. And you're like, you're not going to win this type of a game against this offense because sooner or later this offense is going to do what they did with that no huddle. Uh, And and it was just lethal. The no huddle at the back end of the first half, the hurry up at the back end of the game for that game winning drive. Your defense is tired. You got to help them out and compliment them. So kudos to the defense. I mean, obviously they did break eventually, but if the complimentary football was there and that offense had put up points, then the Cowboys win this game. I just didn't feel like that they, that, that, that really that they did anything defensively different. You know, to me, the, the drastic move to try and take Lamb out of this game would have been to walk Ramsey over there. Mm. I just kind of felt like there were a couple of different times where they passed him through zones, buzzed linebackers in front of him, you know. But to me, it was really about Howard, Ramsey, and Kahu, those guys covering him. You know, you didn't see stuff really on the back end or or – where, like I said, my answer to that was like, if I'm thinking Lamb's killing me, I'm thinking, God, I've got to do something different. I think the, I think the blitzing of the linebackers bothered Dak in this game. I, I do. I think that, 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 you know, like you said, being around the line, when, you know, when, when are they going to blitz? Mm-hmm. And on the flip side of that, Dallas didn't blitz Tua enough. Yeah. That's the problem. When you look he at sat the, back there a lot. When you yeah. look at his metrics when he was facing pressure or blitzes, it was like two of five. Yeah. You know, and they, but you know, the no blitz was, and that's to me, Dallas's MO is pressure and pressure. And to me, I, I kind of feel like they missed an opportunity with that because you could have, I think there were times where when he faced that pressure, you could see he was clearly not interested in standing there and throwing the football. And Tua also had some um, under pressure and not pressure throws that were just bad. Yeah. Where it's just like, oh, that was a bad throw. That throw sailed. Who was he throwing to? Like, no man was in the vicinity. It was just bad throws. And that was 
not under pressure. And then to Brian's point, when you look at the, the how things flipped, okay, so we talked about how Dak Prescott was pressured almost 50% of his dropbacks. Two was pressured only 25% of his yeah. dropbacks. So three quarters of the time, he was back there comfortably operating. You, you can't have that. You got to get back there. Not with those weapons he's got yeah, you too. Get, like those, we, we those guys, about, if you got time to run, like that's going to yeah, be a problem. If Dallas was going to win on the defensive side of the ball, it was going to be taking advantage of that offensive line. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and it, there were times they did, and I just don't feel like there was enough, enough of getting after Tua. You know, and I think that I think Dan and them got a little nervous about the big playability of these receivers, and I can, I can clearly understand it. Covering Waddle is not easy, Co- you know, and especially if safeties, you know, Wilson a couple of times in the game, you know, you're wondering they're in cover two, and you're like, bro, you're supposed to help here. You know, what are you looking at inside? There's nothing there for you. You know, so. You know, Hooker, those guys, they try their best. But, you know, when, you, when you're when you dealing with, with speed and all that, sometimes you just get mesmerized. And I think Dallas got a little bit of that in the secondary yesterday. All right, we're going to take our first break and come sure. back. We will talk Sunday. about the rushing offense. Tony Pollard, Hunter Lipke. We'll talk about all that and what the Cowboys, Cowboys were trying to do and maybe how effective it was or was not. We'll talk about that when we come back. DallasCowboys.com radio. Todd thought it would be secure to jog in the cheetah savannah. Todd believed the big cat repellent he bought online was reliable. And now Todd is trying to be faster than this cheetah that can run 80 miles per hour. But the good news is Todd has AT&T 5G that is fast, reliable, and secure. And he learned the best thing to do is stop running and toss her the backpack with the beef stew. AT&T 5G. Fast, reliable, secure. It's not complicated. 5G requires compatible plan and device. 5G may not be available in your area. See att.com slash 5G for you for details. Cowboys fans, after that move, we've just coined the term Rowdy Replay. Let's roll back the tape. Okay, there's our mascot Rowdy cheering on the boys. And now he's on his phone, on his Bank of America mobile banking app? Staying on top of his finances with his virtual financial assistant, Erica. Bank of America's digital tools are so impressive. Cowboys fans just can't stop banking. Learn more at bankofamerica.com slash can't stop banking. Erica is only available in the English language. You must download the latest version of the mobile banking app, only available on select mobile devices. Message and data rates may apply. Member FDIC. Welcome back into Dear Doctor, the show where I answer life's questions with an ice-cold can of Dr. Pepper. Sheila, let's hear from our next caller, would you? Dear Doctor, my friend supported me during a tough time, but what's the right gift that says, thanks for being a shoulder to cry on? Okay, this one's easy. I say give her a delicious Dr. Pepper. Nothing says, thanks girl, better than a -a one-of-a-kind soda. Yes, any Dr. Pepper flavor will do. Now, just a reminder that I don't need to be a real doctor to know that Dr. Pepper is the one you deserve. They say champions are remembered, but legends are never forgotten. United Ag and Turf offers a winning lineup of John Deere equipment built to tackle any challenge on and off the field. Legendary John Deere tractors, combines, residential mowers, commercial mowers, compact construction equipment, gator utility vehicles, and a full line of golf and sports turf equipment. United Ag and Turf, the official Ag and Turf equipment supplier of the Dallas Cowboys. Visit unitedagandturf.com to find a location near you. Back to the break. How about this? Demarcus Lawrence is Dallas Cowboys nominee for the 2023 Walter Payton Man of the Year Award presented by Nationwide. Help tank raise funds for Dak Prescott's Faith, Fight, and Finish Foundation by casting your vote on, da- on NFL.com slash Man of the Year or tweet your support using hashtag WPMOY. Challenge. Voting ends on January 8th. Vote for Tank. Guy well, played well yesterday, too. Yeah, he did. Welcome back. This is the second segment of The Break. We're live from the SWBC Mortgage Studios at the Star. And this segment is brought to you by Blockchain.com. All right, let's talk about the running game. Uh, you've got Tony Pollard yesterday. I'm um, sorry, Sunday. Uh, he has 12 carries for 38 yards, a 3.2 average. The team overall had 25 carries for 97 yards, a 3.9 average. I have a big picture question for you guys. Is this rushing attack good enough for the Cowboys to get to where they want to be? It can be. Uh, not playing the way it did uh, on Sunday, obviously. But we talked about, prior to Sunday, we talked about how things had started to come together for the rushing attack for the Cowboys. Now, uh, a large large part of that was based on the continuity of the offensive line uh, and the health. Uh, when you had Tyron Smith play seven consecutive games, that helps. Um, but when you look at what happened on Sunday, you know, that we, talk, we were talking about it during the break. We were talking about it 
after, you know, on the flight home, we were talking about it after it happened. Tony Pollard has to get in on that uh, that that touch on the uh, one yard line. Uh, you can't get turned around like that, especially by a defensive back. Like you just you can't. You got to get that in. And then what happens after that? You get the the botched handoff to Hunter Lipke, which goes to a rushing uh, attack issue as well. Uh, and then we know that Rico Dowdle is battling that the ankle injury, but we've also st- seen him perform admirably despite the ankle injury. So they only have two touches, four total yards. Like where was Rico Dowdle uh, in the, on the ground? Um, so if that is what they present on the road in the playoffs, the, the answer is absolutely not. If the trajectory that we saw them on, even though they got walked by the Buffalo Bills, but you liked what you saw from Tony Pollard uh, in those games preceding that as well, if that's the version of the rushing attack and the offensive line that they take on the road, they do have a chance in the playoffs. Uh, Yeah, I think they've been proved. That's one thing. But is it depends what kind of offense are you playing? What kind of offense are you getting? Are you getting the offense that plays at AT AT&T Stadium? Because in those scenarios, you you barely even need to run the ball. Like they have so many uh, explosive plays in the passing game that sometimes the run becomes a little bit secondary. Like you don't really think about it because you just don't really need it. They've just playing so well in the air. But we know that's not always the case, especially when you're going to have to play away from home. That kind of disappears at times. And sometimes the one thing that you can rely on, or in the past, not this year, but we know how essential and how important the running game can be for your offense. So right now, as it is, um, I think you've had plenty of time this season to kind of get a better running game going and it hasn't been the case and I think that sadly it's gonna bite them in the butt at some point I don't want to say that but once they start playing away from at and Stadium I think and we've seen it already we've seen games where you wish you could have relied more like even in Buffalo you wish they would have ran the ball so much more and at times it was working and then it, it just they kind of went away from it um so right now, I think they've been okay, but it's just you're going to need I, – I am I love complimentary football, and you're not always going to be able to throw the ball in the air, pass it, what happens in a game where they do take out a CD Lamb in, again. So it's those scenarios where I do find some concern, and it, it goes back to the O-line health. I always bring it back to – the health of the line and how that affects not only Dak Prescott, but also the running game. I think that has a lot to do with um, kind of the issues they've had this year. I think Mike told you what he thought about the running game Mm -hmm. when he started the second half after the Dolphins go three and out and you get the ball backed up and he hands the ball to Pollard one time, they get one yard and then they throw the ball two other times after that, you know, and then you get a blitz and there might be a hot question there and stuff like that. But yeah, they had no confidence coming off the goal line. He said he had a poor plan when they were backed up, you know, and they were doing with that. So, uh, yeah, it, it it was encouraging against Buffalo, uh, not so encouraging against the Dolphins. And I, I think there's a lot of things that happened for those two quarters. I think the play Carl lost his way. I think the line lost their way. I think the quarterback lost his way. I think the running game, whatever exists it might have, lost its way. They just did not have it. They, they did not have the – when their running game works, it's about rhythm. It's about they kind of get it going, and it supplements some of the other things they do. it. They do it with jet sweeps. They do it with crack tosses. They do – you know, we just didn't see that. You know, they, there's some creativity to their running game, and they can get it, they can get it working. But, you know, in this football game, it was just a non-factor at all. And, and no, absolutely, they cannot win a single playoff game – much less a regular season game if they run the football like this. Yeah, it's interesting because, Brian, I was going to point to the play. I thought this is where you were going when you said there's one play that tells you that told you that. Yeah. But that fourth quarter, first and goal, and they decided they're going to back him, trying oh, to throw yeah. the ball, yeah. and mm-hmm. here you go, sack. sack. Yeah. And I'm like, when they first got first yeah. and goal at the one, 
I was like, okay, here we go. You pound the yeah. ball in. There's no reason not to, right? Maybe the Lipke, and, maybe the Lipke fumble freaked him out in that. Maybe, suit. but take Lipke they, out of yeah, the game, they right? Tried to run, yeah, they, they <laughs> tried to run. It's funny because yeah. you say that because everybody, it's like a hard play action, right? And yeah. you know, and and Adoga's wrong. He doesn't block out, and so now you get the you get the you get the sack. But they're trying to, yeah, they're getting they're playing cute football. Yeah, they're going to yeah. try and run the tight ends across the other way and just flip it to them in the corner. And yeah. to me, that. That's where I look at it. And I was watching this game, the game last night, San Francisco and Baltimore. And it, it what what is very apparent to me, and I, I think right now those two teams are probably the two best teams in the league. I think you can arguably throw another team in there. But I think they've consistently throughout the, the year been the, the Rams are looking <laughs> really good. We've been talking about the Rams, man. They're coming I know. Up. I keep – the, the Rams up. are my hope to go beat Philadelphia yeah, and then go to San Francisco. Yeah, take That's San Francisco out. If, yeah. if Dallas is going to be the fifth seed, yeah. I've talked to people. My dream is for <laughs> – the Rams to be the seventh seed and just go wreck shop a yeah. couple of times and take people out along yeah. the way. The Rams can absolutely smoke Philadelphia. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah they can. So, so I, I think I think that that's the part where, as I was, I was watching that game last night, I was like, the difference between those two teams and every other team in the league to some degree is the style of football they play is extremely physical. Yeah. Mm. They line up in those situations and say. We're better than you. We're going right over you, and we're going to score, right? And and that's the part where I think when you have to do it the cute way, yeah. to me that says something about what you think about your ability to just line up and right. be able to physically impose your will on another team. Right. And I think that's the difference. And, and that's where I was like, it made me start to question how good I think this running game really is. I can't think of a game this year where the Cowboys have said, we're gonna run. We're gonna rely on our running game, and had, that's how we're gonna win. No, it had and by the way, there've been some games where they no, probably no. should have done that, yeah. but they haven't. And that's where I wonder: Is this running game even capable of being that for them in a game where they're gonna need well, it? Because that's gonna happen if you're on the road in the NFC in the playoffs. I think the head coach talked about in the off season of wanting to try and be like that, and yeah. then he realized he couldn't, and then he had to adapt. And is that because of the offensive line or the running backs or both? I. I think there was. I think the injuries along the way have been a problem. Now they played seven straight right. games where they've had continuity, and they've been okay. But man, I, I think this offense is really built to throw the football. Myself, especially when the offensive line's healthy, mm -hmm. with Lamb and you know Ferguson, those guys, Cooks, they're built to throw the ball. And I think McCarthy realized he had a better chance of moving the ball and scoring points throwing it than he does running it. I think my biggest problem with the rushing attack is kind of exactly what you're alluding to, Derek, in that it's the goal-to-go -go packages. Um, so that sequence of Pollard getting turned around and then Lipke fumbling, that's one, one, one and a half yards to go. If you go back and look at the the – the combined statistic of how well or not well the Cowboys have done with goal to go, that's been kind of that their biggest Achilles heel because first it was red zone. Oh, they can't score in the red zone. So then they shrunk it and said, okay, well, we can score in the red zone as long as it's not goal to go. Yeah. So then when it became goal to go, they kept running into like a brick wall as far as you hand it off to Rico and it's prop it stopped right there at the one. You hand it off to Tony, it stopped right there at the one. And now you're thinking, okay, you go into Dolphins and you say third and short on this opening drive, hand it to Lipke, conversion. Yeah. Third and short handed the yeah. Lipke conversion. Yeah. You're like, they got it. They, they got it. They figured they, it no, out. They got exactly. It. Yeah. Nobody and had a problem then, handing the ball to Lipke right, on the goal line. Right. right. Yeah. Nobody did. Because yeah. after what he, he done, fumbled. you were like, okay. And then he fumbled. And then, then, he fumbled, then, he, then yeah. we all went, oh, then, damn, right. how then stupid. It becomes, <laughs> right. Right. Then it becomes yeah. a mental yeah. thing for yeah. the coaches. Yeah. They're like, okay, well, now when you get goal to go, it's, well, we're not going to hand it to Lipke because we're shocked. Right, yeah. we're not going back to that. But then Pollard, well, what happened the last time we gave him the ball? He got turned around. Yeah. So you drop back, and right. it's the yeah, lamb, exactly. and then he yeah. is out of bounds. But then thankfully on that particular drive, oh, Cooks yeah, yeah. was able to come up with it. But I think it's the goal to go package that's their biggest Achilles heel. And if you can't punch it in from one or two yards out with your running backs. That's that's a problem. That's where it really could become a problem. Also, the defenses, who opposing teams are going to be using more of their resources on the passing game and trying to right. protect and cover cover the receivers. Um, I don't think right now you've put anything on film that scares anybody as far as the that, running attack at all yeah. whatsoever. So, going into whoever you're facing. They're going to just focus. It's if it's CD taking the hat off. Then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah. And I agree with you, Derek. It is, it's clearly a, a passing offense. That's what it's become now. But 
It does. It does. Uh, it's, it's just very unfortunate because you do not want to become a one dimensional team and just have to always rely on the passing game because there will be and we've seen it situations where you're going to have to run the ball. And if you ain't scary anybody, if you're not breaking blocks and finding the holes and kind of escaping and going for it, I mean, uh, that's going to be definitely a problem. What is Zeke doing? <laughs> He's still employed, so we can't all talk we, about it. We, no, we will kidding. just say that yeah. Zeke, Zeke is on a team yeah. that's not going to be in the he's, playoffs, but he is, he's, he's had some still, opportunities. He's still he's employed. Done some so just wave hello to Zeke. Let's Hi, keep, Zeke. Let's unlike, keep it pushing. Unlike your team, I miss you. Yeah, unlike your team, he got to win this weekend. <laughs> yeah, right. He did. Just keep it pushing. All right, let's take our final break. Let's come back. I want to flip over to the defensive side of the ball. And Jerry said something very interesting this morning on 105.3 The Fan with Sean and RJ. Uh, he mentioned a little bit about Micah and maybe why Micah's not getting those holding calls. That was an interesting comment. We'll talk about them and come back. This is DallasCowboys.com radio. Todd thought it would be secure to jog in the cheetah savannah. Todd believed the big cat repellent he bought online was reliable. And now Todd is trying to be faster than this cheetah that can run 80 miles per hour. But the good news is Todd has AT&T 5G that is fast, reliable, and secure. And he learned the best thing to do is stop running and toss her the backpack with the beef stew. AT&T 5G. Fast, reliable, secure. It's not complicated. 5G requires compatible plan and device. 5G may not be available in your area. See att.com slash 5G for you for details. Don't put off getting your oil change, Dallas. Take 5 Oil Change. A proud partner of the Cowboys is faster than you think. There's no appointment needed and no waiting room. Yep, you heard that correctly. Take 5 is so fast, you don't even have to get out of your car. You can take advantage of Take 5's fast, friendly, and simple service at any of their locations across the Dallas area. And remember, at Take 5, you stay in your car because they're faster than you think. Take 5, the official oil change of the Dallas Cowboys. It's the official men's skincare brand of the Dallas Cowboys, Jack Black. And right now, Cowboys fans can get 15% off their $75 order. Plus, because every deal needs a playmaker, your order will include a free five-piece skincare set and free shipping. The Jack Black Playmaker is four of Jack's favorites and a full-sized intense therapy lip balm. Make a play for the playmaker at getjackblack.com slash cowboys with the code Cowboys VIP. That's getjackblack.com slash cowboys with the code cowboys VIP. They say champions are remembered, but legends are never forgotten. United Ag and Turf offers a winning lineup of John Deere equipment built to tackle any challenge on and off the field. Legendary John Deere tractors, combines, residential mowers, commercial mowers, compact construction equipment, gator utility vehicles, and a full line of golf and sports turf equipment. United Ag and Turf, the official Ag and Turf equipment supplier of the Dallas Cowboys. Visit unitedagandturf.com to find a location near you. Back to the break. Sean Polite needs your help. He is uh, your 2023 Cowboys fan of the year, and now he does really, really need your help after I mention that again. Uh, vote for Sean to be given the ultimate title of NFL Fan of the Year presented by Captain Morgan by casting your vote at nfl.com slash fan of the year. Welcome back. Final segment of The Break Live from SWBC Mortgage Studios at the Star. Let's talk a little bit about Micah Parsons. This morning, Jerry was on 105.3 The Fan, and he mentioned that he was asked about why maybe Micah is not getting those holding calls. I think it's been now 38, I want to say 38 quarters since the last time can he I, had a holding call. Can I run the, I've done these numbers. Huh? How, many, uh, how many holding calls do you think the Cowboys as a unit have drawn this year? Mm. It's... Mm-hmm. Got to be single digits. Yeah, I was gonna say it's not over ten, is it? Sixteen, sixteen, mm-hmm. sixteen. But they, but but seven. They didn't have a holding call in this game, right? So make that, make that. They played fifteen games. Yeah, Thomas mm-hmm. Smith had one. No, 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 no. no, 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 no the on the defense. defense. Yeah, yeah, didn't have one. Didn't defense, draw yeah. one this game, right? Didn't have one this. Yeah, game. right. Eight of their fifteen games have gone without a holding call. Half their games. Half, half their half games. games. More than half their games have gone without a holding call. Which is amazing for a team to get that, as much that, pressure that as they gets, do. It, that's exactly problem. right. Yeah. That's exactly right. How can you be one of the, one of the one of the most pressure teams in the National Football the League? The most, yeah. yeah, and not draw more holding calls. Yeah. Sixteen total for the year. That, that's amazing to me. The interesting thing was Jerry said on the on the air this morning, which I I'd never really heard someone from from a, a team or league articulate this, but. Basically, what he said was the the refs essentially won't call holding if they don't think the player could have gotten to the quarterback. Um, And and Jerry's argument is that may work for the vast majority of the players in the league. The problem is 
Micah is different. Michael, Micah is special. Micah has a, a burst and a speed and speed close. that can close so quickly yeah. that it's hard to make that determination if he's three yards from the quarterback to say, well, he couldn't have gotten there if he wasn't held when fact is he's yeah. so fast that he probably yeah, could have gotten there. And, and, and they're trying to legislate it based upon how they're legislating everybody else. But it just may not work for Mike. Yeah, but I don't understand how. And again, you know, we sound like we're bitching about it, but, you know, really. But I don't know how you can watch games and like arms around his neck. Yeah, you know, arm around his waist. Mm-hmm. I, how? I mean, I, hands inside or hands outside the frame. I get it. Hell, they had a damn Zach Martin got his helmet knocked off and was pass blocking in this game, and they didn't call it. Yeah, you know, I mean, literally, he's like, "Whoa, bro!" I mean, they, you know. Watkins, uh, Wilkins just knocks his helmet off and he's pass blocking still on the play and they don't call it. You're like, now, okay, how do you not see that? But the thing, I understand hands inside, that's a hard, hard call. But hooking a guy, you know, grabbing him around the neck, rodeo maneuvers, yeah. and you don't call it? I don't, I, I, that, that part I don't understand. I don't know how the officials each week when they get their tape to, and you miss this one, you miss this one. It's like every week they probably see Micah Parsons go, damn, he gets held a lot. You know, that would be my impression. If yeah. I was one of these officials, I'd be going, gosh, dang, they miss a lot of these holding calls in this guy. You know, and you're kind of looking for that, mm-hmm. you know, but you're right. As close as he, as fast as he closes, because the, the, that roughing the passer penalty, as I told you guys in the break, that was super close. Yeah. I mean, it was so explosive when you stop the tape, ball's gone, and he is literally, his foot is right behind Tua mm-hmm. as that ball is out of that out of his hand. That's how. And, and usually there's grace for that kind of situation. Again, as long yeah. as you're not driving the guy into the ground or but, something like that, yeah. there's grace that there's a little period from when he gets rid of the ball. He, yeah, he, he did. He, he, That's why I was like, I don't, well, I don't know like if I love I the said, call. Well, like I said, they said he, tried, he was trying to punish the quarterback. Which I didn't get that. He pushed well, him. Yeah, what's, <laughs> what's it? That was but, momentum but, more than Yeah, that. he's not going to – this poor guy's not going to get calls. He's just not. It's and amazing. And, it's a, it's a, I, don't, I don't know how these officials on a weekly basis review the game tape and don't see that. Well, I, I love what Micah said because what Jerry is saying today to the fan echoed what Micah said one, two weeks ago, I believe, in an interview with the media uh, about the lack of holding calls. And he said, Micah did, that the officials are telling him – the same thing that Jerry just said. He was like, well, you weren't going to get to the quarterback. And Micah said, and this was a quote, he said, you couldn't get to the quarterback. <laughs> yeah. Don't tell Fair. me what I can't right. do. Yeah. I can get to that quarterback. Or maybe someone else can't get to the quarterback. Right. But he's like, I can get to the quarterback. So let me do my job and you do your job, which, end quote, which kind of goes to my next thing. It also is, these officials are human. Yeah. Uh, and and I, I've said this to several colleagues as well. And we love Micah to death. And, you know, his, his podcast is in Enjoyable, and he's always enjoyable with the Q and A's. Um, but the officials are listening; they're listening when every week he gets on the mic, and I, we understand his frustration, and it's justified. It is right; his cause is proper, right? But he has to let the others. Stephen Jones is on the competition committee. Mm-hmm. Let him fight that battle. Jerry Jones fight the battle. The front office, Mike McCarthy, the coaching staff fight the battle. I think now because it's so egregious, the lack of holding calls. I'm starting to wonder if it's the human element coming in where these officials are hearing what Micah Parsons is saying and being like, oh, okay. Yeah. I don't know if no, I'm but buying that. You can, but you can and see also, it. You cannot silence people. Like, Oh, no, and I'm, and I'm, I'm not trying I'm to. saying, and I get it. Like, sometimes Micah goes on a rant, and he'll get on Twitter and say all kinds of things that maybe you'll be like, hey, uh, and, maybe but don't. He, but like, he's get, not get off wrong. Of That's exactly. the thing. Like, he's right. Let him voice. It's just... Because anybody, anybody that was in that position and on the field and having to deal with that on a constant basis and feeling like, damn, I cannot catch a break. Like, it's constantly happening, the same thing. You're going to be mad, and it's okay to let it. And I'm tired. Like, what gets me frustrated is this whole thing, like, Ah, quit blaming it on the refs. Deal with it. That's just what it is. Well, no, it doesn't have to be that. Mm. Like, it's not, you're not going to get any change if you don't speak up. So speak up and keep talking about it. And, and to that to that RTP call, that roughing the passer call, and I said this in the press box, the, the reaction that Micah had, it wasn't because of that RTP call in and of itself. Micah is fed 
up. Yeah. And, and then the optics it's of the fact yeah. that oh, no, you, won't, you yeah. won't call them for holding me, yeah. but you'll call me for that ticky tack RTP right. in a game this close on the road. So it all, it, all of it's kind of boiling over. And because we've seen Michael react and be upset at refs, but I, he exploded to the point he had to be pulled back by mm-hmm. a teammate to potentially Tank avoid, you know, yeah, to avoid potentially accidentally making contact with the ref. And then you get fined yeah. and ejected yeah. and might maybe suspended. So it's at that point, And because it's at that point and the whole world is watching now because these types of reactions and non-calls are on film something has to be done so my thing with mike is i'm not saying you know silent because he his his cause is right we're sitting here beating the drum for it everybody's beating the Just drum like, for let it. It, somebody else it, it, voice that at this point we've heard you say it Michael. Yeah. we get it all mm-hmm. of that's on tape but to do it weekly now I'm starting to wonder. This is just me starting to wonder. I'm not making accusations, but I am allowed to wonder. I'm starting to wonder if these officials who are human beings, who are emotional people, are starting to see this and say, oh, well, if you're saying we can't do our job, well, then maybe we don't see this hold. So I'm saying it. I you can't convince me one thing doesn't play into the other thing is what I'm saying. Well, that, that crew, that particular crew, their number one call that they've made all year has been offensive holding. Mm-hmm. That's their number one. And the one, I mean, they, they miss with Micah. But the one that Cotton had on Clark that ended the game, basically, that that needs to be called. And that's Sean Hockley not following the play, not seeing, and that's the side judge not seeing the play as well. They missed a bad holding call right there that could have backed the Dolphins up and maybe given you a chance. I know the way their field goal kicker was making field goals, it, it was probably a moot point, but at least – You've got to call the game that way. You know, if you if you see a guy getting tackled in when the ball going right at him and then like a defender not being able to make a tackle because he was getting tackled, mm-hmm. that's you got to call right there. Honestly, and I hear what you're saying, Patrick, and I think in a lot of instances that makes sense. The reason why that w- I wouldn't go that far is because I look at the refs and I, I think – First of all, as a part of their livelihood, they are judged and graded based yeah. upon getting the calls right or wrong. I don't think they will risk their grades being lower just to prove a point to a guy. You know what I'm saying? I, I personally don't think so because that affects, by the way, mm-hmm. that affects your ability to get other games and more preferable games. It affects your playoff ability to be games, able to play off, Super Bowl, Super Bowl all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Are you willing to give that up just to make a point to a guy? I don't think so. I, I think it's one of those things where, honestly, I think it's a judgment call, and I think their judgment is skewed by the fact that they don't think he can get there when, quite frankly, he could get there. And that's the oh. difference. I, and I, I, I really believe that when it comes down to it, you know, I, I agree. I think they're human, so they're going to make mistakes. But I think a lot of this, there's some gray area. It's even with the the pass. I mean, with the uh, roughing the passer call. Yeah, they are told. They are told to ref it in a way to where if there's any doubt that maybe it could have been roughing the passer, <laughs> throw the flag. You got one. They got one. Yeah, that's how it worked in that game. But I'll tell you what, the league last night they put Bill Vinovich on that crew in that game last night. Bill Vinovich will let you kill each other in a game. And I, you know what? I applaud Bill Sign Vinovich. me up. I, Sign give, me, me give, up. Me, give me every week of Bill Vinovich because he will let the players decide these no football No doubt. Games. I love yeah. it. Yeah. I love it. All right. We appreciate you guys, Jonas. We'll be back tomorrow. We're going to jump into Lions, talk about the Lions office. This is going to be an interesting Ooh. matchup because two things have to kind of come into play. They're at home, yeah. but they're playing a really good team. Yeah. Mm-hmm. This is going to be an interesting one. We're going to find out a lot of things about this team this weekend. We'll start breaking that down tomorrow. Till then, for Patrick Walker, Brian Broaddus, and Amber Garcia, I'm Derek Eagleton. This has been The Break, live on DallasCowboys.com radio. Thanks, Thanks baby. baby. So you make a good point there. This has <laughs> been a production of DallasCowboys.com and the Dallas Cowboys Football Club. How about this, Cowboys?